didn't know get like end of left out. I was just trying to get to him and push away and then <laughs> you know, someone grabbing you there and you got another coach grabbing you there and you don't know who's right. who. Hello, welcome to a special edition of the No Chop Desk podcast on the OLB. I'm your host, Stel. Um, before I start this podcast, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We've hit a thousand subs. My goodness, what's going on? And this is a fan channel for a club with what? 20,000, 30,000 supporters? Not bad, not bad. I'm joking, we've got a lot more than that. But hey, this is a special edition because we've got no, a gentleman, none other than Will Hondermark of Barnsley Football Club. Will, welcome to the show, mate. How you doing? Thank you, I'm good. And you? Yeah, all good, mate. All good, all good. I love that training top, man. Puma as well. Look at that. Yeah. How are you finding your time at uh, Barnsley so far, man? Yeah, it's been really, really good. To be it's been really good. Just the environment being such a family-type club. It's been really nice. Even me playing with 23s in games sometimes, you really feel that no matter what team you're at, if you're with first team 23s, no matter what staff you're at, everyone's like collectively in it together. And it's, really, it's a really nice environment to work in. Especially when you're young, trying to break in. Sometimes it's not the easiest to find, you know, your bearings. But when you've got a team, the staff, and a club like that, it makes everything much easier. So have you got like a, a mentor at the club, like a player or a coach that you feel maybe that they are involved with your uh, development on a daily basis, but not like micromanaging, but more of like a one-to-one kind of thing? Um, to be fair, I feel like, if I'm honest, for me, everyone's kind of chipped in. If I'm honest, yeah. I've had meetings with from the academy director to the first team manager to the 23s coach. I've had meetings with everyone trying to give me advice, give me tips. I've had um, positional um, analysis with 23s coaches, first team coaches. I've got feedback from first team coach, 23s coach, uh, sporting director. I've got it from everyone. So it's been like, haven't necessarily had one person, but I've had everyone trying to chip in and help me from every side. And it pretty much feels the same as having one person because you've got all these, um, all this advice coming from different people, giving you advice on different areas, which is like unbelievable, to be honest. So tell me something. I know you're at Norwich City and then you had a spell out on loan and then you joined Barnsley. So what are the main fundamental differences you've noticed from Norwich City to, to Barnsley? Um... Differences between the two. Um, to be fair, there's not many because in terms of um, environment and things like that, they're pretty similar. Barnsley being, you know, a town, the club of the town. And same with Norwich, obviously, when you're in Norwich, there's not much else around but Norwich City Football Club, obviously. So they're those are quite similar. But in terms of differences, I would say possibly maybe infrastructure. I'd say Norwich was, was very, very good in terms of infrastructure. They were... They were very, very keen on that. And that was like they had a really high standard training ground and facilities and stuff like that. But in terms of everything else, it's quite similar. I haven't really felt too many changes, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's uh, rewind right to the beginning then, because is it true you were born in France? Yeah, I was born in Orléans, which is a city about an hour from Paris. He's got the accent. He can do the accent as well. Look at that. He says it like a proper Mm -hmm. Frenchman. You speak French? Yeah, I've been speaking French all my life at home. I've never stopped speaking it. Well, so what, where's your, where are your parents from? Uh, my dad is French. My mom is Congolese and she moved to France when she was about 10. So she also has been speaking French her whole life. So at home, both my parents are fully French speakers. I'm a full French speaker and my brother is as well. Wow. So effectively, you can play for France, Congo, Republic of Ireland and That's even cool. even England. Am I right? Because you've got the, you've been here for... Can you, do, can you play for England for five years? Am I right? I think England is five, so I think maybe in a year or two, I, just, I guess I could play nationality, yeah. So you've got four options. Hey, yeah. listen, one day you might replace Angola Kante, bro. You never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> hey, so, um, yeah, so you grew up in France. What, what was that like for you? Um, it was really special to you, here because that's obviously always going to be my, um, my home, my, like, first home. And I've got my entire family there, from my granny to any uncle, aunties, cousins, everyone's there. And it's obviously where I had my first school, um, all my first experiences were obviously in France, but then moving at the age of seven meant that I didn't really necessarily have my entire childhood in France. Mm-hmm. I had a mate in Ireland and made all my friends and growing up, my teen years, I was on Ireland. So it was always has that feeling of like, that's where granny's from, that's where all my family's from, and that's home. But 
still got a second home in Dublin because that's where I like, made all my friends, went to school, played football for the first time. All the memories are in Ireland. Mm. See, I, I keep forgetting that you're only 20 years old, bruv. So mm. like when you're saying that you left France at seven, I was going to say to you, like, what, who were your idols growing up as a, as a kid? You know, because when you're seven years old, look, my daughter's eight and, you know, she does have a little bit of an interest in football. I think it's my fault that she doesn't have it too much because I constantly watch it and I constantly talk about it. Do you know what I mean? I think if I weren't so into the sport, she might be into it a bit more, but she doesn't know about football. It's okay. She knows about Paul Pogba. She knows about a few Armonia players because that's the team that I support in Cyprus and she's met a few of them. But in terms of, you know, you growing up, did you have any idols when you were that young or was it when you went to Ireland and you started getting more involved in the game that you felt, oh, yeah, you know, maybe Thierry Henry is one of my favourites, maybe Zidane, whoever. Um, naturally, for me, obviously, um, when I was in Ireland growing up, and I was always coming across, because obviously I didn't know any English at the start, so I was always kind of labelled as the French guy. Okay. So naturally, even when I did learn to speak um, English fluently, I still had that, like, feeling of, um, I had to, like, learn this. So I've always felt like that. French part has always been deep inside of me. And was it difficult though? I mean, were you treated any different because of where you were from or the color yeah. of your skin, for example? Because I know like play, players like Paul McGrath, you know, representing the Republic of Ireland, and he had those issues when he was younger, but we're talking 30, 40 years ago. Do you know what I mean? No, no, to be fair, I've been, and I don't know whether I should say it, I'm lucky enough, but I've been, I've never had any issues in terms of being discriminated for any reason at all. I've had obviously. My friends have always joked with me being French, obviously, but I've never had any kind of negative mm. issues and negative matters because I've always went to really nice schools and I've always had really good people around me. I've never had any issues like that and I've never been made felt anything other than comfortable to fair. So even when I couldn't speak a word of uh, English and I, I went to school because the first day of school for me, I didn't speak a word of English and I was crying on the way in. Mm. Cried every day going to school because I didn't want to go. I didn't know anyone. I didn't, couldn't speak with them and even that period from, I think it took me about a couple of months because you're young, so you learn quite quickly. But even that period of not being able to speak to me, speaking fluently to them, becoming, you know, getting used to having speaks and trying to make friends, that whole period. As, as far as I can remember, I've never had any negative memories or moments that I can connect to that. I can connect to that, that part of my life. So what about your surname then? Because it doesn't sound French. I thought it would be, sound, sound more Dutch than anything. See, this is like another term because my grandparents, uh Belgian on the Dutch side. Okay. So obviously there's like a Dutch side to Belgium. Yeah, where they, it's literally split in half, isn't it? So you can cross there's a line, isn't there? Kind of so you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my so from my from my grandparents onwards, it's very like they've got a very Dutch history, they've got a very strong Dutch history. So that's where my name comes from. So you history. can even play for the Dutch national team. My goodness, look at this guy. <laughs> Multi-culture, yeah. Jesus. Uh, you know what? I'd love for you to do one of them. You know them DNA tests where you send like uh, your, yeah? <laughs> you got every nationality, man. Yeah, <laughs> crazy, but yeah, because my, my granny's obviously, he's Belgian, he's got Belgian history, but my granddad has um, Belgian Dutch history. So we obviously got his name. And yeah, because um, addition to that, obviously, because my granddad worked in, in the army. Mm. So when my dad was born, he was actually placed in a bel in a German camp. So my granddad was just occupying in Fr before in France, I think it was about 1970s to 1980s. There was like just a bit, there were just like uh, French army camps just uh, based in Germany to help them out. And my granddad was just operating on one of them, being a mechanic and had my dad on one of them. So my dad was obviously um, stayed there for like a year or two, but did could play in German nationality as well if he wanted to. Wow. Is your, is your granddad still alive? Is he still alive? No, he sadly passed away two mm. years ago. He was like exceptional to him. But no, he passed away. But my dad, yeah, my granny, my granny, my granddad lived in that camp. Like when well, my granddad was working there with the army for a year or two, and that happened to be when they had my dad. They moved straight back to France after that. But my dad was born in, in Germany. That's incredible, man. And the thing is, like, I'm, I'm 40 years old, and I still remember talking to my grandmother about stories about her husband, my granddad, who I never met because he, he died by the time I was born. My mum was 18 when he died. So when I hear these stories, I think it's immense. And it's great that you at 20 years old know about your lineage, know about your, your grandparents, the struggles that they went through, what they did. You know, I hear about my granddad being a prisoner of war in Italy. 
you know, and being a sailor and going to Nigeria and coming back with some seeds he planted them ended up being a massive marijuana plant. You know, in, <laughs> you hear about these stories, but I'm sure you've heard some great stories as well, you know, and as I said, you're so young, you're so grounded and you know your family history. And that's important as well, because you've got the potential to be, you know, a top, top footballer, and yet you still haven't forgotten where you come from, which is which is remarkable. It's a remarkable thing. I, I don't know that many footballers that can can say that, really. Yeah, no, for me, it's always been, because the biggest people in my life are always my family. It's always mm. been my granny, my granddad, my mom and dad, they've always been the biggest people in my life. So knowing everything about them to me was obviously most important, knowing everything about my dad, where he's from, where he was born, growing up. Same on my mom's side in Congo and that, that history on my mom's side and then my grandparents and my granddad being in the army and working as a mechanic and all that to me was like, it was a no-brainer to like indulge in all that and learn as much as I can and I probably still don't know everything to be honest. Mm. So who bought you first pair of boots? Because you owe them everything. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be my, it's got to be my parents. My parents definitely bought me the first pair of boots. I remember I think they were, I'm not sure if these were my first pair, but they were the pair that I remember the most when I was really young and they were the Rain Rooney T90s. Okay. Okay. They had a 90 sign where you're like, you're supposed to shoot the ball on the sign and then you score. Uh-huh. <laughs> so did you, did you always dream of being like a striker or an attacking yeah. midfielder or something? To be fair for me, I didn't really like, I wasn't really that into football when I was young. I, my dad was just a football fanatic. Okay. He was really into football because being French and he played what team did he support? He sports Leon. Leon, okay. So him being French, and he grew up obviously when there was Zidane and Taram, and mm-hmm. but obviously he naturally was a huge football fan and played football himself. So he wasn't necessarily pushing me, but necessarily when your dad's a football fan and he's French, you're gonna like necessarily just try play football. And I tried, and I wasn't really heavily into it. And I kind of moved around. I played striker, I played defender, I played winger, I played every position. And then it was only when I hit about thirteen, and I started to just say, why not just try it? Why not just go for it? Just work and put my head down and see where it takes me and then I just never really look back then mm. so you was it was Shelburne your first club if I'm not mistaken um, or were, you, were you with someone else prior to that yeah I was Clester, which is just my really really local grassroots team and was that just you just turning up and kicking the ball for them yeah Literally just playing twice a week and then played on the weekend I was purely just like I just I just walked to the training ground because it was two minutes away and that was when I was about I'd say about seven to maybe 12. Okay. Yeah. And then you got found by Shelburne. Is that right? They, they had scouts or? No, it was just mainly just trials. To be fair. It was just, oh, okay. That team uh, ended up splitting up. So I just ended up looking for a different team. And then that was a bit like not hectic, but it was like just trying to find a different team. Because obviously when you're a parent, you're more focused on just the environment for your son. So there was like a different environment in Ireland where you've got like the very high competitive teams. And my dad didn't know if I was like ready for that because I wasn't, I was very relaxed. I'm very, I'm a very calm person. So when I was young, I was even more relaxed. I wasn't necessarily focused on uh, the competitiveness. I was just trying to just enjoy my football and play. So we kind of had to like find and find the right fit uh, fit for me when I was young. So that was like a a period that went through. But then, yeah, then I hit Shelburne. And then from there, I was just excited to be fair. So tell me about the move to Norwich then. How did that come about? Um, for that one, I've actually heard the stuff I found out myself, which is that um, I was playing for Jota the first team, actually. And I'd been playing for them a little bit and I played a couple of games and I heard that they'd been watching me. But I didn't Oh, no one told me just to make sure that I wasn't going to get my head like turned or start losing focus. I just kept playing. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the team, Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Jack Byrne okay. came from there. He went to Cyprus from, from yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we had... Um, Obviously, we're playing a league below them and we're still playing men's teams. I'm playing now and then. I'm getting in. And then for the Rovers game, the midfielder who plays ahead of me, who's like a club legend, but I think he got a red card. And that was the biggest game of the season. We're playing against the biggest team, essentially, in the country in a cup game. So that's why we got tied against them at home. And I got to start that game. And I just like, took over that game and ended up getting my <laughs> And we ended up winning that game because of a penalty I won and had a really good game. And from there, I think that game kind of triggered, I think there was two, three clubs then who came in and said, yeah, we've now after that game, we've seen enough, I think. Okay. So you've gone to Norwich City. What was your, 
was the first thing that you noticed about the club? Did you think, oh, this is this is like big time now? Or did, did you feel a little bit, you know? I struggled a lot. I struggled. Yeah. I struggled a lot at the start because the most I'd ever trained personally was three times a week. Right. And two of those sessions were actual sessions. The other one was just a recovery session or a preparation session. So I'd only ever really trained twice a week intensively. So when you come there and you've got players who've been at Liverpool, at Arsenal, who've been training every day since they're about seven, I was like well behind everyone physically. Not necessarily technically, but definitely physically. I was a good bit behind. I couldn't keep up training every day for a while. My fitness levels weren't as high as theirs. I struggled to maintain them and I, I had to do a lot of extra running. A lot of like my chest was burning most days. Gym was like very tough because I'd never lifted weights. I've never had a personal gym. So lifting weights now every day and being asked, that was very tough. And the first year was a very, very tough year. And I think without that first year of just me getting my head down and just working, I didn't even play much. I wasn't starting. So I just had to keep working and working. And then the second year is when I then finally kind of spread my wings and said, physically, I'm here. Fitness wise, I'm not worried anymore. I'm fine. Technically, I'm here. And then that's just kind of like, I really had a second year compared to the first year was like there was like night and day to be fair. I don't think there are that many players left at Norwich from that squad that you're in. I don't think not, not that many. A lot of us went out on loan to be fair. So there's a lot of us that went out on loan. Um because we were all second year scholars, second year pros. So a lot of us went out on loan, I remember to Spain, to Scotland, um, to lower divisions. I went up to League Two. But um no, we had a quite strong group too. We had a really strong group. But then I think once the group started getting older and players either started to go on loan or, and started kind of try, trying to find the next step from 23s, then the group kind of left. But we did have a very strong group that didn't really, not many players had left in that, in that period. So you went on loan to Harrogate Town, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, in, term, in terms of a learning experience for you, because you played in Republic of Ireland, then you moved to Norwich, so the step up was must have been huge for you. And you've gone on loan to Harrogate, which I wouldn't say is the same level as Ireland, but I think is a, a level where you were comfortable at. Is that was that fair to say? Um, yeah, it was definitely it was definitely a level that I'd seen before like, in terms of the style of play and and the intensity wasn't exactly as high as when you're playing maybe <clears throat> when I'm playing the likes of like Man United in 23s football and the game is quite intense. I think the intensity level was a drop a bit lower and the game was a bit more direct but I would say what I struggled more in that was more just an environment of that I'd never been in where the intensity not of the game but of the needing for points of the desire to just you've got to win every second ball that type of intensity I never had it in Ireland it obviously wasn't that high because of the quality and at 23s it's still 23 so everyone's expecting to make mistakes but in this the intensity of just needing points needing wins of demanding results no matter what was that and then I'd never really seen it before I'd never been in a first ingestion like that so what would you say was the biggest learning curve for you not just at Harrogate but in in terms of you know your development at Norwich and Harrogate in between would you say that there's anything there stands out yeah I would say that it's it is quite a bit cliche because everyone does say I would definitely say that it was mentality I feel that physically it's not the hardest thing to work on yourself physically. I feel that like anyone can get in the gym, lift weights, and you know, do your thing physically or technically. Everyone can do drills, but mentally was the thing where I realized that every time I've managed to push through mentally and get through it, I've always ended up something went well. And I feel that there's been times where I felt like I can't. This is too hard. Like I know sometimes I felt like and my mom came over to see me for a week or two, and I was thinking like this is too hard. I Physically, everyone's ahead of me. Technically, they're all like perfect, all on point. And I'm not even playing games because they're all like, ahead of me. It's so hard. And there was times when I was like, I might be able to do this. And same with Harrogate when there was a part of Harrogate when I wasn't playing because they were just demanding more direct players. They were more experienced and knew how to just play that game. And I was thinking, if I can't get a move, I can't, and I can't, I don't know if I can do this. I'm in League Two and I can't play. And there was times when it was just tough. And every time that I've managed to just say, just get it together, just work hard, put my head down, forget about the rest, just work, focus on me. And I've ended up not playing for Harrogate Town and I've only played maybe two games, two, three games for them. And then I've, a year later, because I've pushed mentally, I'm at Barnsley and I'm playing two, three games in the championship now. So I've passed six months at Harrogate 
where I was like really doubting and it was like a mental, mentally tough period where I only managed to play two, three games and then I've come to Barnsley now and the champ and now I've played the same amount of games in a month as I did at Harrogate League 2. I find it very impressive how as a, at 20 years old, you have made so many sacrifices to be where you are at the moment. And I think if you took a step back and wrote down, I mean, just, just watch this back and listen to what you said about what you've gone through. I know you probably know this already, but it's the realization that, you know, you've, you've moved from Ireland to France, not speaking the language and you've learned the language and you started playing football and then you've developed to the point where Norwich have signed you, then you're struggling there. Then you go to Harrogate and you're struggling. And all of a sudden, you know, you've worked your backside off. You've made, as I said, so many sacrifices and here you are, a championship club uh, playing games. I think that's a testament to you, your family, and um, what, as I said, what you've been through. There are many footballers at your age would have just packed it in or they've just given up. Um, is there, is there like a, have you, ever, have you ever come to a point where you like, when you've thought to yourself, you know, this isn't for me, what do I do with myself now? Or is it like football is the one, this is what I'm doing? No, I definitely think that no matter how, Determine you say you are, there'll always be times when life football will just knock you on your backside and make you think, no matter how much you say, I'm going to make it no matter what, there's always times when <clears throat> even the biggest champions have had moments when they thought, I don't know if I can do this. So I don't think that anyone will ever be able to escape those moments. It's just being ready for them because they come in different forms, different shapes, different sizes, and you have to be ready for it. It could be in a family issue, it could be in anything that will at one point push you to your limit. And that's the point where I think people need to just realise that, oh, this is the moment where I need to push through because at the end, there's always something. There's always a reward at the end. That's just, I believe that 100%. So I think that, yeah, I mean, for me, I've obviously now and then I come to realise like the Harrogate six months and how much I've pushed through. But I think that it's also important for me to keep realising that it's never really going to necessarily stop. There'll always be another challenge. Mm-hmm. Because I want to keep going higher. If I was settling for this, then I would say I can stop here. But if I want something higher, then I'm going to have to put in some work that's even higher. And that's just the give and get. So I think that as much as I've been through till now, maybe I've been through the hardest of it, but I think that I shouldn't ever believe that oh, well, I've done it so good that I don't think I, need to, I definitely need to do more and I'll be challenged more. And maybe even to limits where I've never been yet, I'm not sure. But I just I need to just be me, be ready for it. And just be expecting at any moment because it's football. You could get an injury, new player signs. There's so many, like, especially being footballers. Anyone that's played it knows it's a crazy world. You could have a new sign and that is in your position, like wondering what's going on. I thought I was playing. They signed some Brazilian striker now or injury, change of managers. You get sacked. This is like I could sit here for hours and tell you about how many scenarios would come up that could just make you think, oh, I need to, I need to, what am I doing now? Well, these what I've been told by, by numerous current, uh, current players and ex-pros is that your biggest threat is your teammate, you know, because effectively they could be there to take your, your position, you know. So in training, you're competing not against, you know, your I don't know, Sheffield United and your middle school. You're competing against your Corley Woodrows. You're competing against, well, okay, that's a different position, but I'll give an example here. So, yeah, you're right. There's so many different variables that could determine your future. But what the next question I want to ask you is about strength and conditioning and how, you know, you're 20 years old, you're still growing as well. Um, you've obviously filled out since your time at, at Norwich City. I've watched clips of you, uh, YouTube clips, and I can tell you're, uh, you're very creative in the middle of the park. You're kind of that box-to-box midfielder. Has that position kind of changed since joining Barnsley are you more sitting deep protecting or are you still given that license to be a bit creative and bringing the ball forward um I definitely think it has even before Barnsley it's definitely changed full time because I went from I was a quiet attacking midfielder at Norwich I didn't really play defensive due due to just my power and pace just getting forward and being able to be in the middle. But the thing is, this power and pace thing, is, is that fair on you? Because we hear that with other players, but you've got a lot more in your locker than just power and pace. That's what that's what I think for me, I've, as much as people may, people could look at me and say, it's just power and pace, or people could say, he just runs, or like, and that's, I've never, that's no problem. I think that I've always known that I have attributes, I have a lot of attributes, but I've got key selling points, which are power and pace, and then what I bring with that, because a lot of players can have power and pace but then if that was just that, obviously sprinters would be the best footballers. So obviously know that no matter what, 
I obviously know that if I'm playing at the, I've played at the highest level nearly at every every place I've been. So I know that if I'm playing at it, my parent pace isn't enough to get me there. I've got to have a lot of technical ability, a lot of football knowledge, a lot of mental awareness, and a lot of things. So I think that my parent pace is just what makes all that even better. It sublimes everything. I'm able to do things quicker. I'm able to do things for longer, faster. And that's just what sublimes it. So I think that. But at this level, I think that, yeah, I think my position has changed a couple of times. But now that I've, as I told you, physically, fitness-wise, established myself more, that they've, it's been clear up that they want me, they've asked me to just be box to box, use your legs, use your power, use your technical ability that we want you on the ball in the middle. But because of your attributes that you can push people off the ball, you can drive past them, we want you in, in our box and in their box to use it. I know you've got a, an Austrian head coach and I'm guessing his methods, tactics, training methods, they're very different to what you're used to. For me, and this is going to sound, I don't know, uh, a lot of people might disagree, but I think that that part of the world, Germany, Austria, they're, they're a few levels ahead of the UK at the moment in terms of the technical side of things, especially diets, training, etc., strength and conditioning. What are the major differences you've noticed from your current head coach to previous managers? Um, I would definitely say that I can see the differences in terms of the demand technically. For example, one of them is that as a midfielder, we've worked on something where I pick up the ball quite low on the pitch, which is obviously most, most managers would say don't. In the midfield, just get up high. Don't try to pick up there. You're going to lose it in the middle. But we've been asked to get the ball quite deep on the pitch and play with it so and try to get it forward. So that's something that's a risk that I know that English managers, not necessarily all, but a lot of English managers before or now still would say, don't bother with that. And he's pushed, obviously, playing football to like a level where I don't think a lot of managers would. And I think that I have seen it with other English managers who now are adapting to that kind of like level where they've got the German managers who are really structured and really trying to play in a way of not necessarily just playing football, but trying to like beat their opponent down. And I think that that's something that I've seen with this head coach is where that we're not just playing football and just trying to get the best out of the game. We're trying to really like play a chess game, trying to bring the ball here to use it there, and then bring it back here. And it's really, it's really you can tell from the sessions, from the tactical analysis, from what we're asked as a midfield, especially that um, we're not just being asked to just pick up seconds. We're being asked to be in certain positions at certain moments to pull the opposition to exactly to really like you can really see the pictures unfolding and the reason why you're doing things and that's I guess yeah that's the very German Austrian side which is that everything's calculated everything's organized everything's efficient yeah and I think that's a massive um a massive learning curve for you big uh, educational point because you know while listen, I've, I've spoken to former players of uh, you know Arsenal Academy Tottenham Academy and they've gone to other clubs and when they've gone to other clubs, they've been told, well, com completely forget what you learn at those clubs because we do things different here. Whereas I'm getting the impression that when players come into Barnsley, they're not told forget what you've learned, but use that as a tool to help you develop and improve. Yeah, definitely. Because you've got players, for example, here who've played, who've been used to playing more direct football. So you've got players who've been used to playing more direct football and just being really just an aggressive, hardworking team. You've got players who like me, possibly from Norwich, came from teams we just we constantly play out because of Norwich, obviously, Farrakh was a manager, so our philosophy at the club was just that you got to play out. So you got players, like, for example, you got me and then you got other players, so you got the balance in the two is that, obviously, the head coach, Marcus, doesn't just say, just play at football or just kick along, he finds balances in that. There's times when to play and there's times when to go along and be more direct, <clears throat> but that there must be that braveness of that we can't just stick at one just to be safe. But the thing is, you can't just play ball. You can scrap as well, can't you? Yeah, exactly. I and I heard a little... A li <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> Stoke so City. Is it Stoke City? <laughs> I didn't see it. But, you know, because obviously, you know, we, we have a, you know, a mutual friend and uh, I follow the timeline quite a bit on Twitter because social media is, is very big at the moment. And I see that, you know, type in your name after the Stoke game. And I see you play this. This guy can scrap. He's one of us now. And I'm like, what happened? Come on, what happened? Can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was that I think the game obviously being 1-1 and it was like a cold night, obviously at Stoke. So it was like always going to be tensions high. And then we've had 
the player Claudio who's in the middle with me and he's dying for a challenge got to the ball first but the other guys come sliding through and got a red card so from that moment tensions hit another high now it's hit like another peak he's got they've got someone sent off and they've, obviously everyone's arguing and complaining and so that's already tensions are high and then I think the game goes on and the game ball goes out for throwing on the near our coach and the balls come back in our coach is like trying to give it to one of their players and their staff is like trying to get it back in as quick as possible but our coach is just looking for the player to give it to him their staff comes over runs over and tries to like get it off him and kick, it, kick the ball off him and obviously our staff is like what are you guys doing over here and then it creates a whole row and then um in my eyes obviously all i seen was <clears throat> i seen my assistant coach he was getting grabbed by like three stoke players and my assistant coach was obviously tensions were high so i was just trying to at first, I separate one of their coaches, and then I see the assistant coach, and I'm trying to get him away from them. And then as I'm trying to get the assistant coach away from them, obviously, you like have to like push and shove people to get to him. And then that's how I got in the middle of it. And then I was like, didn't know it would get like end up like that. I was just trying to get to him and push him away. And then you know, <laughs> someone grabbing you there, and you got another coach grabbing you there, and you don't know who's who. <laughs> and then obviously, me being me, I'm obviously a big lad, so I know that I'm, I was going to attract attention just being like. <laughs> Exactly. Stood that like a sore thumb, mate. <laughs> yeah, I knew that in the video, and even in the middle of it, I had a feeling that someone's going to end up trying to grab me because they're going to see this big lad coming in, pushing everyone. Bro, I, I bet you any money the next day in training, you have people high fiving you. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've had, a, I've had a couple of shares we've had, even the coaches, some of them call them, that call them Mike Tyson. <laughs> it was, it was, for that week, there was a lot of obviously shares of just banner going on about that, obviously. Yeah, but see, this is it. This is um, this is football, as they say. This is the culture. You know, it's it's something that happened, and then it gets forgotten. But something like this, where you know you've kind of taken leadership of it, and it's shown that you know you're going to take one for the team. You're you're there, and I think that again, that that's something that's inside you that it just happened. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't like oh, I'm going to just jump in. It was like right, I see my 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 teammates, my coaches in a bit of trouble. I'm getting in there, and I think that's. Straight away, that gives you that kind of cult uh, hero level standard, doesn't it? You know, you've, you've stood up yeah. for the team, and it's yeah. For me, it came quite natural to me, obviously, because I'd only come on, so I wasn't even like I was in the game for the full match, and I really it meant like it obviously meant a lot. But when you just come on, sometimes it's hard to get to the same level as everyone else who's been on for the full game. So it really just came naturally. I just genuinely just like just like I've been on the bench the last game, and I'm starting to get into like fighting for the team, and I'm starting to realize like. I need these points and I'm really getting into the mindset of being a first team player and then I get told to come on and make my debut and I come on and then I'm into the game and you can feel attention obviously and then I just you just become a part of the team become a part of the club and you start everything that means a lot to them starts to mean a lot to you and you start to understand it because now I'm on the pitch I'm feeling it I'm feeling that if I lose the ball you could lose these three points so I'm starting to understand everything that's coming clear and then naturally when then you see someone like see something going on you see that you're managers, your players are getting like something's going on, you're gonna try like what's going on? Like no no one's, no one's putting their hands on my players and my managers. Absolutely brilliant. Well mate, look, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can tell that you're enjoying your football, you're enjoying the club. Um and uh, long may it continue because as I said I've I've seen you play and uh, you've got a bright future ahead of you. Uh, I know you're called up to the uh, Republic of Ireland under 21s which was a great uh, achievement. So having only played two or three games for, for Barnsley is absolutely brilliant. Um, and long may that continue, as I said, man. Appreciate your time. Yeah, cheers, cheers. I definitely appreciate you bringing me on as well. I'm so short notice. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, fantastic. We'll do it again sometime soon, man. I know you've got another one lined up later today. Are you looking yeah. forward to it? Yeah, no, definitely. I'm. I definitely do enjoy these sorts of things. So I definitely am looking forward to that as well. Excellent. I didn't want to ask too many Barzi questions because, you know, you don't need to be repeating yourself. So I'll let you, I'll save it for the next podcast. There you go. There you go. Right, boys and girls, we're on the mark, ladies and gents. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview. We'll be back very, very soon. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have some news about a takeover for the club. Um, it's, it's been a, a topsy-turvy week already and we're only 10 hours, 40 minutes into Monday morning. So until next time, Gobelia, 